Welcome back, pre-market traders. This is Kyle Bazzi and Jake LaCour filling in for Dennis Dick and Joel Conan, who are out this morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to bring on Mr. Herb Greenberg from TheStreet.com, financial uh, media journalist for over 30 years, um, has done everything. 40? Yeah. Been everywhere, done anything. Uh, Herb, welcome to the show, man. Hey, glad to be here, guys. So let's jump right into it. We uh, we're just talking and looking at you know cores uh, who you have been very active on talking on Twitter. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, their their earnings report and what's going on with them? Yeah, I actually red flagged this on uh, on Reality Check, uh, uh, which is the uh, the subscription product I have. I re I red flagged it back in uh, in April uh, April fifteenth or so. Uh, the issue here is, and perhaps the first signs of crack. Uh, in this story are margins. And if you look at the gross margin, the gross margin missed estimates. The company said it would be up. Uh, the guidance was for, you know, slightly higher than expected, and it was slightly higher than expected, but it wasn't as high as analysts would have expected. And even more, more than that, it, it, it was really lagging the revenue growth. And, and the bottom line here, especially when you factor in that the company said on its earnings call this morning that guidance, uh, that they guided for lower than expect, lower lower guidance uh, in the current quarter than a year ago. That there's a heck of a lot of discounting going on at a company that you wouldn't expect to see discounting in. Now this is a really loved stock. It's made a lot of money for a lot of people. My hunch is that after the initial shake off of margins, that uh, you'll see a big defense by analysts uh, 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 on the margin front. And who knows what the stock will do because this is just a quarter. But part of the story. That I've I've been telling in Reality Check, and then I actually had on my blog yesterday on the street, and is that um, the company also sells product to a related party, and that 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 product is booked through North American wholesale sales, and that related party deals with China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau, and you you have to question how much of that business is actually helping skew the business in this country. And whenever you see a related party, I don't care if it's disclosed as this is. is you always have to factor that in, and this is a significant related party. So, look, I think Coors is one of those great tension stories, good bull bear stock, about to get more tense as, as time goes on. Uh, it's, you know, like I say, I see these things. It's in the red right now. By the end of the day, it could be in the green. I, I don't make stock calls, but I make issues calls, and there certainly are increasingly a few issues uh, that are, are in need of uh, being, uh, you know, paid closer attention to at Coors. Now, everybody, make sure to get in the chat room if you have questions for Herb. And Herb, let's talk about the Reality Check newsletter. What is that, and, and how long have you been doing it? Uh, Reality Check is around um, is uh, is about three months old. Uh, we we've basically given it a soft, what I would call a soft uh, launch. Uh, it is uh, not as newsletter as much as as I like to call it an, an issues identification product. It's it's geared to people who are concerned about you know understanding what the risk is in various companies. Certainly those that hit my radar. Uh, they're not. It's not meant to be a stock call list. Though interestingly enough, the my watch list. I have a watch list of say about 15 names or whatever. Uh, if you were to look at it, it's well outperformed the market over the past uh, you know since the newsletter started or, or since Reality Check has started. Um, and we're, we're in the process, effectively, of, of shifting this to much more of a retail, uh, uh, an institutional product. It's available to, uh, to, to anybody. Sophist it, it, I think sophisticated investors, certainly, um, anybody who wants it, but we're, we're making the transition to institution because I think institution understands the concept better than retail because the typical retail person doesn't really care about risk until it's too late. The, ri the, the way I view this is, is, is the average guy is looking at this stuff and says, just tell me how much money I'm going to make, how, how, how fast I'm going to make it. You know, I want to just trade it for a bit, and that's it. And, and I'm in and out. And that's not who this is geared to. This is geared to somebody who's looking to build a greater intelligence um, in their own files and in their own minds on companies that they may, be they may own, be interested in owning, uh, may want to, uh, I suspect, short, or, or, or may want to just, you know, you know, have additional info for overall research.
No, that's a great point. We always preach risk here, and you hit the nail on the head with, you know, retail, we're not looking at risk. They always want to look at the gains. And, the and smartest guys are always, you have to ask yourself, why is it the institutions and the smartest guys are often saying, how much can I lose before how much mm-hmm. can I make? But the average guy is looking at it and saying just the opposite. It's just saying, just tell me how much I can make. So they want the, they want the products. They'll subscribe to any product that will say, buy this, buy this, buy this. And in this market full of, full of, full of noise, and this market is full of so much noise, you know, there's the, 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 the active trader. And that is, in, you know, tends to be more on the retail side, of course, on the institutional side as well, and in the algorithmic side, uh, you know, just, just cares about the moment. And that's never how I've done my job. And that said, there are times in the moment things happen and, you know, trades occur based on something I, I write, but that's not my, my motive in life. A question someone emailed in to me when they knew you were coming on the show was, is Coors looking at what's more of a symptom of the, the market? You know, with earnings just ending, we saw revenue numbers continue to miss on average, but uh, the bottom line beat, uh, meaning accounting's kind of playing into that. Do you see any of that in the market right now with earnings season just ending? Well, I think you see it in it certainly, you know, it depends if you're talking about the market in general. And I, I, I think you see, uh, you know, companies had cut, cut, cut to make their numbers and they can only cut so much. So, you know, when you're, when you're on that sort of gravy train of just, you know, constantly thing, you're making things look better, you're constantly beating, you're always forced then to make your results that much better. And that's not the way the real world, world works. And, and so I think in this, you know, I haven't looked at this earnings season per se specifically because it's been such a long, drawn-out earnings season that finally I think is coming to an end and before the next one starts. But I think on some of these companies, Coors is a great case. When you have an outlier, which Coors has been, think about this, Coors has been an outlier to its, to its peers, to its customers like Macy's, and to the mall traffic in general. It's been the one glowing exception all the way across the board. But, you know, in order to keep that going, they got a, they got a discount. They got a discount more. And when you're looking at a growth company, you don't want to see discounting. So, and which, which by the way, it, it would be a great segue into Solar City, which we got to talk about. We got to talk about Solar City this morning. Yeah. Look at Solar City. Stocks off a point and a percent and a half. A company put out a press release this morning that is like made my jaw drop. Solar City and Groupon offer first of its kind deal on solar power. Solar City is couponing. <laughs> what? I mean, whenever you see discounting, whenever you see couponing, whenever you you don't do that when your business is strong. You do that when your business isn't strong. And Solar City is now, with this very big press release, is signaling, I believe, what I, and it's another red flag stock in reality check. I wrote about it originally back in January, that it's, um, it, it, it's, it's pulling out all stops to, to, to try to reignite growth. You know, that we were just talking about the, you know, uh, Josh Brown was on talking about how the energy uh, infrastructure here in the U.S. is going to be vastly different in the years to come. It's just about, you know, what, what players are going to take advantage of it. Solar City being the biggest. Does this mean that the sector as a whole is slowing? Um, is there changes in the environment? Well, first of all, it's not just Solar City. They're, they're, the, they're the biggest public company. There are plenty. This is a highly fragmented market with plenty of um, uh private companies uh, that you've never heard of. You know, I live in San Diego, which you could argue is, you know, you know, ground zero for solar. And every weekend in the newspaper, there are full-page ads by companies you've never heard of. This is a highly competitive market. And the real issues boil down to even the issue of, you know, getting something for nothing by leasing a solar system, put, system putting nothing down. Is that a sustainable model? Does that come back to bite people who got something for nothing? And yes, it was too good to be true. This is an industry that's trying to hash itself out on what the best way to go uh, ultimately will be. Um, and so you're really seeing an increasingly competitive market. And with Solar City, you see a company where you, where you could argue there are some numbers games and accounting games and things that, 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 that perhaps are, are or should be red flags. Because in that case, I was pointing out, you know, the way the street was valuing the company was based on some metrics that you could argue were quasi made up. And uh, the company has gone out and uh, – uh, you know, came out this past quarter and gave you guidance for 2015. My goodness, that's six months ahead of when they typically would have given 2015 guidance. And when that happens and you see a company come out and try to guide well into the future, 
I argue that that's a way to keep your eye looking there instead of looking where it really should probably be going, which is what's happening right now. So, you know, they put some big numbers out there on what they expect to um, do uh, a year and a half from now. And uh, whether they can get there is anybody's guess. They're giving themselves a lot of breathing room. But I think you can see from the stock there's been some um, – Solar City certainly has, has lost some of its uh, its flair. Well, once again, everybody, this is Herb Greenberg. If you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll try to get to them. Herb, I know we've been covering solar here, and I'm kind of interested in see what you think how Solar City compares. Like we have, uh, you know, kind of a big battle between U.S. solar and Chinese solar companies in general. Do you think that that's also going to hurt Solar City here? I know you said there's a lot of competition out there. How do you think that plays into it? I don't know. I've been looking. F I honestly, I've been focusing on Solar City specifically, and I, as it gets to the broader solar industry, uh, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, if, by the way, if you talk to uh, if you talk to you know people who install solar, one thing they'll tell you is they'll say, you know, they'll say that th they'll they'll start getting into the battle between U.S. and Chinese made solar panels which is a, an, an entirely different issue. But, it, you know, and it hits sort of to what you were, you were suggesting. But, you know, I'd rather focus on the individual company in this case, and that's, that's what I've been doing. Well, discounting in Solar City is definitely something to continue to look at. Um, in the chat here, Herb, we have uh, from Tim Melvin asking, how much do you think buybacks have propped the numbers? And this is going back to a little bit of earnings. Uh, do you think that's played a, a part this season? Substantially. It's been, it played a part for years. And, you know, you, you really have to go back and ask yourself when you look at this, and I know studies have been done, and the question is, you know, is that creating, genuinely creating great value for investors? And how many of those buybacks have been done when we look back in retrospect at prices uh, much higher than, than the stocks are right now or than the stocks, uh, you know, have been since the buybacks? Uh, in some cases, it's been a good buy. In other cases, it hasn't been a good buy. But you could argue that companies should be doing something other, something be something more with their company than buying back their shares, uh, it, like reinvesting in the business and uh, or or making acquisitions, uh, assuming they're good acquisitions. But buybacks, I often you often see as a defense mechanism against uh, against bears, against uh, a stock that can't quite you know keep moving higher. And, you know, it, there are multiple ways of looking at it. And I, by the way, I talk to a lot of smart people, and I have smart people on both sides of that equation. But I would argue when you look at, when you look at an earnings report, and, 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 you know, remember, the street is fixated on, on the headlines of how, um, on, on how a company is, has, has done this past quarter, right? And if you look at it, one thing you may want to do is X out and normalize uh, results from this quarter versus – prior quarter or, or year ago quarter had everything remained the same and there not been buybacks. And then you've got to look at that in, in, in connection with revenue. So if revenue is flat or falling, earnings per share are rising because, uh, because of buybacks, is the business really that much better? Does it really matter? And I would argue no. And I would argue that's just really more financial engineering than it is the reflection of a very well-run business and, and a company that is really growing. You've got to look at the top line, too. And again, the street looks at what the street wants to do on any given day. The street will, you know, it, 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 look, look, let's, let's go back on cores for a second. Now, the stock has been up and down this morning in terms of it's down 2%, it was down 3%, it was down, you know, barely anything. So it's bouncing all around. This morning when the whole margin issue was first raised, people thought, ah, not an issue. And then when the company came out and gave some margin guidance that they didn't like, the stock fell. Later today, analysts may come out and defend it. And then people may say, hey, there's nothing to worry about. And it'll go up. Now, it depends on whether the street wants to believe the story anymore or whether there's fatigue with the story. Remember, there's so much psychology that goes into so many of these trades. Because, again, in the end, How's the business doing? When I look at a company, when I start out looking at a company, I just you know start working on a project. I go to to uh, a, a, a ratio screen that I look at just to take a look at how is growth been. And so you really want to take a look. I look at top line growth. It's the first thing I look at. I just want to see what's the trend. And when you start looking at that, and you start looking at the trend in margins, and you start looking at the trend in net income as opposed to earnings per share, because I don't care about earnings per share, you just store EBIT, EBIT, whatever you want to look at. You look at whatever the you know every company is a little different, and the industries are a little different. Uh, you get an idea of what's really going on. And if 
the street is defending a stock where growth is slowing, that usually doesn't have a great a great ending. That story doesn't usually have a great ending. But remember, people, you know, I just did a piece yesterday on Iridium uh, in Reality Check. I wrote a fairly significant piece on, on Iridium, which is a great blast from the past company. Um, and, you know, that is a company that uh, has, 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 has uh, that the street has wanted to believe. Uh, the company has put out very strong guidance, uh, but that it's missed its guidance. And it's missed a variety of metrics, but the street wants to believe. And it's just a story that's seen, you know, that t- I call it a, you know, a leap of faith story at this point. Uh, we'll see what happens. So that's you, what a lot of these are, a leap of faith stories. So would you say, like, I know you're kind of focusing on, uh, you know, t- uh, top line growth and say how it's kind of contracting and a lot of this uh, growth seems to be coming from buybacks. Would you say you're a bearish on the overall market right now? I don't get into market calls. I would say that... <laughs> You know, it's never been what I, I've done. I leave that to the macro guys. But could you argue that things, you see signs of frothiness here, there, and everywhere? Sure. And sometimes it's not quite what you might expect someone to talk about. So if you go to San Francisco and you look at, uh, you know, what's going on there in real estate, and you look at a company like Salesforce.com building a 70-story building that's, you know, at a cost of, you know, a million, a million square feet at a cost of over $100 a square, $100 square feet or around $100 a square feet, you say, you know, it's got people who've been around a long time looking and saying, man, this is a sign of something. We don't know what it is. So, you know, you reach these peaks, and, and, and there's no one, no one rings a bell when frothiness, you know, occurs or when there's some, you know, when you can say yes. The bubble's about to pop. But you know you've got to be on your toes. And that's why it's so wonderful for stock pickers and people who really can, can buy businesses as opposed to stocks. This is, should say business pickers, I guess. Um, Herb, so, um, yeah, Herb, Herb, Gre- um, Herb Greenberg here. Uh, you know, we got to wrap up here in about 60 seconds uh, of uh, thestreet.com. Uh, Herb, I, I had a, a question that I'm, I'm personally curious about. Um, as you are, you know, revered by many, including myself, as one of the pioneers of uh, financial media and journalism, um, we had Josh Brown on this morning talking about his new book, Clash of the Financial Pundits, how the media influences your investment decisions for better or worse. I wanted to get your take on what you think of that with um, all your experience in this space. Uh, I think the media is part of the story in terms of influencing, uh, influencing the, the, the conversation. It always has been, always will be. I'm not convinced it's quite the same as it was now because I think social media plays an additional role. And all of the whatever you want to call media today plays a role. There's just so much more information than there was even a decade ago. So, you know, media is as you define it. Great. Herb, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, again, I'll drop the link into the chat. Uh, Herb Greenberg, his new newsletter. I, I, I read, uh, I don't know if you're doing the marketing, Herb, but get a reality check. I like that. Um, ha- hire an experienced watchdog to guard your back. Look, Herb, I, I've uh, followed you for a long time. Um, our, the founder of Benzinga, uh, Jason Raznick, is, is a true fan of yours. So if uh, we are, I, I promise you guys it, it'll be worth your time too. Herb, thanks for taking the time this morning and coming on. Appreciate it, guys.